Santa Destroy California is home to many things, from the Pound Dollar to the Warriors baseball team before they became the Red Tigers, and also at a movie studio called Bear Hog Studio. But most importantly, it is host to the United Assassins Association's own ranking fights. And because of this, the town has also become home to many dangerous and ruthless assassins, all gunning for that number one spot. And of these killers is the masked mercenary mailman multiplying using mechanical might and masquerading as a megastar, Destroy Man, Santa Destroy's very own superhero. Hey, there he is. How's it going? I'm having a stroke. Are you going to shake my hand or what? I'm having a stroke. Wow, you're not even moving your arm. I'm having a stroke. Are you okay? I'm having a stroke. Your face looks weird too. I'm having a stroke. Are you having a seizure or something? I'm having a stroke. When someone is having a stroke, they may not be able to say it with words, but their body language will tell you loud and clear. I'm having a stroke. Destroy Man, or John Harnett, is a reoccurring boss throughout the whole of the No More Heroes series, and is a one-sided rival to Travis Touchdown. He has gone on to make an appearance in every numbered entry of the series so far, and is already being planned for future entries if they get made. And because of his persistence and charisma, he has cemented himself as part of the No More Heroes identity just as much as Beam Katanas and Coconuts. And while his approach to assassin work is undeniably successful, it is a bit underhanded, though it gets its results and has at least earned him some interest from the UAA even after his death. Though before we get too into that, let's understand the meaning behind his name and design. Now, before he was called Destroy Man, he was John Harnett, a large man with a lackluster male delivery job and a lot of pent-up aggression. His name and physical appearance seems to be in reference to the MMA fighter Josh Barnett, who Suda claims was also partly the inspiration for Travis's own design. Now, John and Travis are actually very similar people in a way. Not only are they the same age and based on the same dude, they also use their time and money to live out elaborate fantasies that let them work out their violence and aggression. Travis cuts off heads and aims for the top, while John dons a mask and administers justice through his superhero identity known as Destroy Man. Now, the name Destroy Man is pretty to the point, with the Destroy part taken from Santa Destroy, his hometown and location of Bearhug Studios, and the Man portion obviously being in reference to the common trope of ending superhero names with Man, like Superman, Spider-Man, Batman, uh, not that one. Though, interestingly enough, his last name, Harnet, is also close to the Irish surname of Harnet, which is a bear, and ties back to the movie studio Bear Hug, which was given its name based on the pro wrestling submission move The Bear Hug, which was popularized by an actual fucking bear from the 50s to the 70s. His name was Terrible Ted, and it has nothing to do with Destroy Man, but I felt like this was too important not to mention. Now, this movie studio was used by Destroy Man to film his privately funded movies, which went on to become cult films and were popular enough to spawn off merchandise like the Destroy Man t shirt that Travis can find in the dumpster around Santa Destroy. Now, Given the state of the film set and the later revealed practices of the UAA, these Destroy Man movies are likely all snuff films of Destroy Man's ranking fights, where he lets his true face come out. Though Destroy Man isn't born with any special powers like the superheroes he parodies. Instead, he utilizes technology to give himself the upper hand, as everything that makes him powerful comes from his SFX Converter, a special battery-charged mechanical bodysuit that comes in a multitude of parts, starting with his gloves, headpiece, spine piece, and belt that all grant the wearer superhuman strength and the ability to fire lasers as well as manipulate electricity. Now, the main point of focus for the costume is his large crotch-hugging belt, which, cool detail, the center light glows every time he speaks because it is voice activated. Now, the belt has a design that appears to be in reference to two different things. Firstly, the X shape of the belt seems to be mimicking the classic Xbox shape, which feels intentional as No More Heroes was originally pitched to be an Xbox exclusive title before Suda learned about the Wii's motion controls. But also, the belt is in a clear reference to the classical bulky Kamen Rider belts of the early 70s, with Suda making it no secret that he loves Kamen Rider. This is, this is that rock quarry in Ibaragi that they used to film those tokusatsu shows, isn't it? Awesome! I can't believe I'm here. This is where they film Kamen Rider Zeo, you know? And the name of the gadget even has SFX, which is the abbreviation for special effects, and Kamen Rider's genre is known as tokusatsu, which can essentially mean live-action special effects. 
Along with this, a majority of his big attacks are references to other media, like Destroy Pound, seemingly in reference to the superhero landing pose. The Destroy Cannon is the Street Fighter Hadouken. The Destroy Beam is Superman's Heat Vision. Destroy Spark is the Star Wars Force Lightning mixed with a Joy Buzzer. And he even has Austin Power Fembot Nipples. Though his finishing move, the Devastating Destroy Buster, is a powerful pelvic projectile, painfully punishing perps by piercing them like paper. And its positioning is likely in reference to the Schwartz Ring from Spaceballs, which is fitting given that he is a parallel to Travis and Suda claims that the Schwartz Rings were the main inspiration for Travis's own Beam Katana. Though, even with all those advancements, Destroy Man's deadliest tool is his deception, as he puts up the persona of this heroic and honorable warrior, insisting on sportsmanship before and after his match. But this is all a facade, as anyone who falls for his tricks will end up getting killed. And there are a lot of cool details leading up to Destroy Man's true nature that all hint to his more unhinged side as well. Firstly, of course, you have his hero name of Destroy Man, as it's an inherently unheroic name, focusing not on how how he got super, but what he does with his power. But then you have this visual and audio element of the cutscene before he transforms, which is a detail that I was made more aware of thanks to Henry Prez's own Deadly Individualism series, where the camera shakes and the sound of this pounding creature desperate to escape can be heard, which both shows how uncomfortable John is outside of his costume, but also that he harbors a darker part of himself inside. Well, actually it is me. Oh. That makes sense. Never mind then. You've got a job to do. But first, I need some time to get ready. And finally, his insistence that Travis should turn around and lower his guard makes him immediately suspect, as it's this kind of behavior that was pointed out by the last ranking fight Shinobu as strange or suspicious for a killer. I just need you to look the other way for a second. A second? Yes, just a split second. I don't think it's too much to ask. A real gentleman. I just turned my back, but you didn't strike. You are fucking with me! Altogether, every little detail suggests to you that this man is deceitful or dangerous, despite his outwardly respectful demeanor. He is, in a way, a monster pretending to be human, and this is reflected in his extreme murder battle stage, firstly, in it being a movie set, as acting is his strongest tool, and it's the one he falls back on more than anything else. <laughs> Help! What? Help! There you go! <laughs> and because of this, you can never really tell which part of Destroy Man's personality is the genuine one, even in the later games. And then you have the minions that litter this stage. At first, they just seem like dudes wearing paper bags on their heads and wielding a variety of weapons, when in reality, they're all strange monsters with blue, green, and red skin, who are all dressing and wearing the identity of humans. They are things pretending to be human. And their designs kind of remind me slightly of the Heaven Smiles from Killer7, though it's clear that they're to reflect Destroy Man in this design decision, and it's very possible that their costumes are also a joke on how low-budget tokusatsu stuff can be at times. Which, speaking of Kamen Rider, after Destroy Man meets his end at the hands of Travis, he returns in the second game in a clear Kamen Rider reference, this form being the new Destroy Man, which is almost a direct reference to Kamen Rider 1 and 2, even with him becoming half-cyborg in the process, but also he is referred to internally as Destroy Man 1 and 2, though him coming Coming back from the dead is also to play into the eternal rule of comic books that no one stays dead in comics except Uncle Ben. Though, one of the most noticeable details about his return is how he appears to have a split personality now, as the two bisected parts seem to have a mind of their own, with each coinciding a color associated with them. The more polite and honorable part of Destroy Man lives in the red body, while the aggressive killer harbors the blue body. This is a pretty clear reference to the Japanese character archetypes of the red and blue Onis, but ultimately their split personality is just as much of a facade as they were together, as each share each other's pain and go along with the same trick. It's very possible that there is no split personality at all, but the same consciousness inhabiting two different bodies. Also, interestingly enough, the color coding of the new Destroy Men completely counter the perceived understandings of the red and 
blue oni archetypes, showing how it was simply just an act of the collective destroy man put up in order to get a sneak attack at the start of a fight. And while a lot of his fighting style remains the same, he now spreads his moves out among two bodies. The blue destroy man attacks from long distance with his destroy cannons and lasers, while the red destroy man does melee attacks and focuses on using destroy spark. But they can both utilize a new shield-like move similar to the AT fields of Evangelion. Though because of their separated forms, he has created a new super move called the Dual Destroy Buster, where both Destroy Men fire their beams into each other and create a powerful black hole-like projectile that builds up in size like the Spirit Bomb before honing in on their target. Also built into his robotic legs are jet propellers, which allow him to leap great distances and fly around without the assistance of a prop like he originally needed. Also, interestingly enough, the warehouse you fight him in seems to imply that even in his bisected form, he still maintains his delivery job, as it is filled with boxes ready to be delivered. And he also threatens Shinobu by saying that he'll make sure that Travis receives her head in the mail. Which actually brings me back to a point about the original game, one of the cool details about Destroy Man, and possibly the reason that he isn't geared up when Travis arrives at the studio, is because he is the one who delivers Travis the letter that sends him to the right location, as Sylvia mentions needing to send him snail mail. Though back to No More Heroes 2, the stage before his fight was actually entirely added to extend the gameplay segments of No More Heroes 2, as according to the original script, Shinobu was actually just supposed to jump from cutscene to cutscene while cleaning up the past that was haunting Travis. Also, interestingly enough, the new Destroy Men only count as one single assassin, reinforcing the idea that he didn't split his consciousness, but instead is the same person inhabiting two bodies at once, as No More Heroes 2 shows that you can kill multiple assassins at once and shoot up the ranks. Also, the fight here works to help represent Shinobu's own growth as an assassin, as in her defeating Destroy Man, the assassin that was ranked higher than her originally, it shows without a doubt that she is stronger than she was in the previous games. And with his death here, Destroy Man would go dormant for roughly nine years, as while Travis was going down a path of self-discovery, Destroy Man begins his path of self-recovery, as somehow he was able to repair himself following the defeat at the hand of Shinobu, likely thanks to the assistance of the UAA, given their ability to call him up whenever they need his services. And because his previous new Destroy Man form proved that he could inhabit multiple bodies at once, he began to focus on a new effort, the Mass produced Destroy Man initiative, which might be in reference to the Doom bots of Marvel Comics, which are robotic duplicates of Doctor Doom, which allow him to be in many places at any given time. Also a cool detail about the mass produced Destroy Men is their rotating heads. The pattern in which they swivel on is based on the cut pattern that Shinobu left Destroy Man's head in at the end of their fight. It's also possible that the idea of the mass produced Destroy Men could be in reference to Dragon Ball and the Return of Cooler, as Metal Cooler is a a hive mind, self-replicating lesion, hell-bent on revenge and global conquest. Also, the robotic forms of Metal Cooler are sometimes referred to as the mass-produced cooler, or mass-produced metal cooler. And according to Notorious, Destroy Man had a very similar plan to Cooler. Also, references to Dragon Ball aren't entirely unfounded in No More Heroes in general. Come on, man. Don't underestimate my prowess in battle. I'm right up there with Pick. But if we're talking about anime references, we should discuss the actual main body that Destroy Man has taken up, his True Face form. True Face is a Destroy Man cyborg, which appears to be the main leader unit for his entire mass-produced army. His appearance is similar to the mass-produced model, but with a much more demonic-looking design, even featuring a second face on his abdomen. This whole design seems to be a reference to the gunmen of Gurren Lagann, which makes sense given the anime and space theme of this entire game. And if I had to guess the specific gunmen, I'd say it was Viril's, as at one point it had a very similar Warhawk to True Face his own. Now, True Face's own cybernetic body allows for Destroy Man to mix up his moveset, combining some of his earlier abilities together like Destroy Spark and Pound to create a shockwave on the ground, and then you also have him being able to fly with ease now and deliver a Destroy Punch, all without the assistance of the wires he once needed. True Face is also able to fire two Destroy Cannons from each hand, or even convert a cannon into a large Spark Shockwave. He hasn't stopped with his cowardly trick, still offering and insisting on a handshake 
shake before battles, and the mass-produced units will even flee from fights and fake knee injuries, only to attack you when you get closer, like there's some god hand enemies or something. Boom. But besides this, one immediately noticeable aspect about Trueface is his new viewpoints, as he purports himself to be a superhero directly, and claiming that he will destroy evil assassins like Travis. Though, this is just another example of his childish illusions of grandeur now played out on a grander scale. And it also seems to harken back to Destroy Man's original developmental name, Justice. Now, this idea of a manufactured superhero who is trying to fund their future through other nations' military seems to be partly inspired by the comic book series The Boys by Garth Ennis and Derek Robertson. The comic series is a satirization of the idea of superheroes and Destroy Man seems to take most amount of inspiration from the iconic antagonist of The Boys, Homelander, even originally matching him visually and sharing the same first name. And Suda apparently enjoyed The Boys enough that he would reach out to Derek Robertson to make art for No More Heroes 3 specifically, including the cover of the game. Though the the role that Destroy Man plays narratively in No More Heroes 3 seems to be a way to demonstrate Travis's own growth as a person, as while Destroy Man has only doubled down on his embracing of fantasy, Travis has evolved past the need to indulge in his. In a way, Travis grew up while Destroy Man grew stale. Oh, this dude is such an immature little bitch. Even more than you. But one part of his character that only grows better with time is his boss themes, and he's got a different one for each game. Starting first with his original No More Heroes boss theme, Stop Hanging DJs, which was given its name in reference to the lyrics to the Smith song, Panic. Now, the boss theme was created by Masafumi Takada, a very talented composer who Suda worked with in the past on games like Killer7, and would later go on to make iconic soundtracks for games such as Danganronpa. Now, the goal he sought to fulfill with this boss theme was to tell the story of the fight through its sound. And I can sort of hear it, as the sort of mechanical nature of the music plays into Destroy Man's own reliance on technology to be a successful assassin, with the slow introduction of other instruments coming in to help finish out the song, which seems to be in reference to the production work that goes into creating movies, especially ones that feature heroes in them with heavy special effects. And his ability literally has the term special effect in it. Following this, we have No More Hero 2's new Destroy Man theme called Kill You Twice Over by Neuratino. It's sometimes referred to as Twin Electromagic, as it's what the file is named in the game itself. And while we lose out on the sound and intention of Masafume's work, here we have a song that intends to capture the feeling of the songs that inspired No More Heroes to begin with, that being punk rock. As the theme gets us excited to partake in the boss fight, it is a constant up and down, and the name of the song is in reference to something that New Destroy Man says right before the boss fight begins. We're gonna, gonna kill, kill you twice, twice over! over. Finally, we have the theme for No More Heroes 3, Feast Mitsuri, which was created by Nobuaki Kaneko, and seems to be an attempt to replicate the machine sound of the original, with Kaneko adding his own little touch to it. And it seems to reference the fact that Destroy Man in No More Heroes 3 is stuck in the past, and he may advance with technology, but he himself doesn't really go anywhere, so that's why the theme tends to sound like the original boss theme. Now the name, Feast Mitsuri, 
could also play into a reference to something that Travis told him before their original duel to the death, as Mitsuri is a Japanese festival, making the name of the song something like Festival Feast. And as Travis described Destroy Man, If Challenge had a taste, you'd be quite delicious. And with his now overwhelming numbers, he has become a feast worth celebrating. Though, interestingly enough, before the original No More Heroes released, a demo for the game showed off Destroyed Man's stage. Now this discovery came from the archives of the Cutting Room Floor page for No More Heroes, but basically in 2007 there was a Tokyo Game Show demo for No More Heroes that you could play the whole of the stage right up into the end of Destroy Man's boss fight, but one key thing was different. He had a different boss theme. Instead, it was a theme that would go on to be later titled Rocket Surgeon, and it is the final boss theme of Gene in the main game. This is actually a great demonstration, though, of how Destroy Man has been part of the series for a really long time, as not only do you have him in this demo, but he also appears to be one of the first bosses that was developed for No More Heroes 2, according to other data found on the cutting room floor, which also shows an early version of his boss arena that was filled with destructible environmental pieces. Though, it is unclear if you would still fight him here as Shinobu, as the stage doesn't seem designed around her jumping, but her jumping was terrible, so maybe that's better. Also, the original script says yes that Shinobu was always supposed to fight him. And finally, before we even knew much about No More Heroes 3, we had concept art pop up at an IGN livestream with Suda, showing off concepts for not only Destroy Man's true face and the mass-produced units, but also Kimmy Howell and, of course, the final Destroy Man, something that some people have probably been waiting for me to get to. This was a boss that was not going to appear in No More Heroes 3, and Suda has gone on to say that if it were to appear, it'd be in No More Heroes 4 if it was made. Meaning that Destroy Man is so intertwined with No More Heroes as a game, that concept art for him exists for a game that may never actually even reach development. Though, if one person helped turn Destroy Man into the iconic character that he is now, it was the stellar voice work of Josh Keaton, whose performance really helped shine a light on his character's shifting personalities. Seriously, I think I might really die from laughter. It hurts. Someone help! <laughs> oh, God! <laughs> oh, shit! I thought I was gonna die there. You know, it's dangerous coming to a place like this alone. You ought to be more careful. Seriously, terrible things can happen. Shake my hand or the fight can't begin! Come on, no tricks. Ultimately, Destroy Man is one of the most standout bosses from No More Heroes' own history. And while his fights may not have always been the most fun, he works as a perfect narrative tool for everyone's growth in the story of the series, as well as a great representation of someone who actively refuses to kill the past, one of the core themes of Suda's works, with him cowardly rejecting death and begging for help in his dying moments to his crass and rude approach to killing, he has in a way become the anti-Travis touchdown, and it truly shows that there really are no more heroes in the world of Santa Destroy. Also, of course, I personally love seeing his one-sided rivalry with Travis get more and more pathetic from his side as the series continues and his actions are dismissed over and over again. Destroy Man came back? Huh, didn't see that coming. He was a no prick, though. I'm glad he's dead. Again. All right. Fuck you! <sighs> what the fuck are you even trying to do, you weird-ass bastard? So I'm hoping one day we get to see that final Destroy Man in action, and I'm sure that it'll be a moment to remember, whether it is one of glory or subversion. And if you enjoyed this video and want to see more videos like in the future, I have a Patreon at patreon.com slash medinotthebadguy. And if you want to improve your handshake game so that you can keep up with one of the best handshakers in the world, well, I suggest that you go to buyshumanetta.com and purchase yourself a copy of Shimanetta, a boring road where the concept of dirty jokes doesn't exist at buyshumanetta.com.